This is asked and answered from the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard defamation trial, part two. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, welcome to Legal Bites. If you're new here, my name is Alita. I'm a lawyer licensed in California and DC. And on this channel, we explain the law one bite at a time. So if you've been around the channel for a while, you know that we have been covering from gavel to gavel the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard defamation trial. And if you also have been taking in all of the videos that we've been putting out, you also are familiar with the asked and answered part one that we put out recently. The whole purpose of putting out these asked and answered videos is because we have a lot of frequently asked questions that come up time and again. And so basically the idea is to compile these into a central location so that folks don't need to keep asking it and we don't need to keep answering it. Anyhow, so in this video, we actually have 20 questions. So let's get into them. The first question is, can Judge Oscarati talk about the trial at her conference? So if you are aware, of course, this week, there has not been any trial because of the fact that Judge Oscarati has been at what is called a judicial conference. She's basically been at a week-long conference that all judges in Virginia are supposed to attend in order to get sped up on um, the new laws that have been passed in Virginia. And so this is a pretty decent question that folks want to know, how much can she talk about it? And the truth is, she's probably one of the least limited out of anyone in terms of talking about the case. She probably can talk about it to her fellow judges uh, that might be curious about it. However, at the same time, they are just as familiar with her as to the position that it would put her in if she were to talk too much about the case. Now, if she were to spill on her own subjective opinions as to how the case is going, who she thinks is winning, which way the evidence should be favoring at this point, those would probably be improper comments on it. And I doubt that the other judges that she's encountering want to put her that into that kind of a position. And even if they aren't thinking about that, she probably herself is, because if that kind of information were to get out, that is something that could potentially impact the outcome of the case. And that could turn into a situation where maybe there's room for one of the parties to appeal after the verdict comes in. So my guess is that even though she probably can talk about it more than most people involved in this trial, she probably still doesn't want to. Anyhow, number two is what mechanisms are in place to ensure that the jury isn't getting influenced by the media and social media over the week-long break? Now, this is another really good question because folks understand that the jury is not supposed to do independent research. They're not supposed to talk to anyone about this case at all. Um, and so over the course of a weekend, that might be a little bit easier to avoid people, avoid the news, and then they get back in on Mondays and then you know, Mondays through Thursdays, they're just taken up with the trial the whole time. They probably don't want to talk to anyone at the end of the day. They're probably just as exhausted as a lot of us are after watching the trial all day. But over the course of a week, it is much more likely that someone is bound to come across something from the media or from social media because this is a case that is literally everywhere, everywhere. It's all over every single social media platform. There are memes, there are videos, there's all kinds of content out there about this particular case. And the truth is that there's really a lot of trust that is put into these jurors throughout this whole process. The judge doesn't really have any kind of means for ensuring that they are staying away from social media or the media in general. The court doesn't take away their phones. The court doesn't sequester them except for in some very extreme cases. The jury here is not sequestered. So basically, what mechanism is in place? An understanding about the seriousness of this case and the seriousness of their roles and the seriousness of them avoiding that kind of information. Basically, there's a lot of trust. Make of that what you will. Some folks have a lot of trust in human beings um, and in jurors in the process. Others, not so much. Okay, number three is, does the jury decision have to be unanimous? Yes. It's not always the case that in civil cases, there has to be a unanimous jury verdict in order to have a decision in the case. That usually is what we see in criminal cases. But in this particular case in Virginia, that is the situation that we have here. It has to be unanimous. Otherwise, it is possibly a mistrial. Number four is, can the jury talk to each other about the evidence before deliberations? And that is a hard stop no. As I mentioned before, during the break, the jury is not allowed to research or do any kind of investigations. They're also not supposed to um, talk to anyone about the case. That includes other jurors who are sitting right there next to them. So 
not until deliberations. Once they get into deliberations, which is after the closing argument, that's when they can go off and have their, their full conversations. And they're expected to have full conversations with the other jurors before they come to some kind of a conclusion. Okay, number five is, can the jury rewatch the trial footage during the deliberation? The answer to that is no. What they get when they go into the deliberations is their own notes that they have been taking throughout this whole time, and they get the evidence that has actually been admitted. So the footage, they're not going to be able to rewatch the, the trial footage that has been recorded by the cameras in the courtroom, um, but that's why they are able to take notes. Okay, so number six is, can Johnny Depp, Amber Heard, and the legal teams and the expert witnesses watch the news, social media, and other testimony? And the answer to that is yes. So in any case, the lawyers involved in this case, they can look at whatever they want, whenever they want. The question is, whether they want to, because they have their own strategies, they have their own preparations that they've been making for months and even years, really, in this case. So how much do they want to listen to outside voices is a whole different question. That could be a situation where you've got essentially too many cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. But when it comes to Johnny Depp, Amber Heard and the expert witnesses, we are talking about witness testimony here. And typically it is a rule that witnesses are not supposed to pay attention to any of the news or or to see any other testimony in the case. And that is because there is a rule for exclusion of witnesses, particularly lay witnesses that are testifying to certain facts. The reason for that is because they want the witnesses to be independently giving their testimony. They don't want people to start lining up their testimony with other witnesses whether they are doing it intentionally or unintentionally, subconsciously, because they've seen so much of other people's stuff. Now, of course, realistically, a lot of these witnesses also know about the testimony of a lot of these other witnesses because of the UK trial. Um, but regardless, you kind of have to just like pretend that this case is living in its own little universe here. Now, when it comes to expert witnesses and the two parties, those two are excluded from the general rule that witnesses are supposed to stay out of the courtroom. They're not supposed to see any of the uh, news or social media kind of commentary on the trial itself. Okay, so number seven is, can expert witnesses talk with the legal teams if they're subject to recall? And the answer to that is yes. So remember how the expert witnesses are excluded from that witness rule, right? That they have to stay outside of the courtroom. So they're allowed to sit in and watch all the testimony. And part of that is because in order to form their expert opinions, remember they have a certain foundation that has been um, laid for them to be expert witnesses. It means that they are able to give their opinion based on all of the information in the case. So it usually is the case that even before they are, you know, sitting there as a potential rebuttal witness, that they have looked over the deposition testimony, they've looked over various reports, they've looked over all kinds of things that a normal lay witness would not be able to look over for their testimony. And the reason for that is because the, the expert witness is supposed to give their opinion based on all of that. So that also means that throughout the trial, they also are able to sit in the, in the courtroom and to watch the testimony. And that includes when they are sitting as a rebuttal witness as well. And further, as for the communication between expert witnesses and the attorneys, they are allowed to communicate so long as they don't go so far as to like coordinate their potential rebuttal testimony with the attorneys because that can turn into in an over kind of coaching kind of situation, which is improper. Okay, so number eight is, can Dr. Hughes and Johnny Depp be recalled to the witness stand? So yes, technically they can. Um, both of them have already testified. Both of them have already been cross-examined by the other side. The question is, what is the purpose of their recall? They ha uh, Now, a recall has to be within the context of responding to something that has come out since their testimony. Basically, it's intended to give the opposing side the ability to ask a certain witness questions that they didn't really have much of an opportunity to ask them about before. So that would have to do with primarily asking them to either respond to another witness's testimony um, or to respond to other evidence that came out that wasn't on the record before. That has to be, of course, balanced with the extent to which the attorneys that want to recall this witness had the opportunity to ask these questions before. So if the purposes of recalling Johnny Depp 
are just to ask about the same allegations or the same incidents that they have already asked him about, that they already had the opportunity to ask him about, you know, if they already knew basically what Amber was going to be saying on the stand about, you know, certain testimony, certain SA allegations, certain bottles and like that kind of stuff that they never asked him about before. There's a legitimate question as to whether or not they are properly allowed to ask him about that if they already had the opportunity to ask him on the previous cross-examination and they didn't. So where how exactly that's going to play out is going to be very, very interesting. And I'll be very curious to see what Judge Oscarate basically determines going into a, a potential recall situation with Johnny Depp in particular. Okay, so number nine is, do rebuttal witnesses have the same restrictions from watching trial as other witnesses? So I kind of answered that already about the expert witnesses, but the same is basically true regardless of whether a witness is coming in as a normal witness that's being called in someone's case in chief, or if they are a witness that's coming in only as a rebuttal witness. Think, for example, Kate Moss. Yes, she is hopefully not watching any of the testimony in this trial, hopefully not watching any of the commentary or any of the clips in this trial because she is subject to all of the same um, witness restrictions as any other lay witness would be. So my anticipation is that they, the, the team for Johnny Depp probably already had conversations with her saying, hey, listen, there's going to be a lot of publicity on this case. Stay away from all of it just in case we need to call you, just in case we have an opportunity to call you. So hopefully that's been the case. If you are you know, uh, supportive of Johnny Depp's perspective, Johnny Depp's side of this case. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. Okay. So number 10 is, have you heard the dating app allegations against Amber Heard's new PR guy? Yes, I have heard the allegations about it. I definitely have seen that he was apparently kicked off of a dating platform because of some of the comments that he made to a woman um, <laughs> that were fairly serious, very, fairly egregious. Um, however, I also personally have not wanted to talk too much about that because number one, it's not really relevant to the evidence involved in this case. It's not really relevant to the lawsuit at all. I mean, he's he's the PR guy, so the court of public opinion, of course, is very you know relevant for that sphere. But as far as the actual lawsuit, the actual trial itself, not particularly relevant. And number two, the other reason why I get I have a lot of pause for that whole story, all those allegations, is because. I don't like to jump into um, certain allegations just because allegations are made. I, I don't like to jump to conclusions at all. That kind of is how we got into this whole trial in the first place, right? I mean, that's supposed to be one of the lessons that hopefully culturally we are learning is that just because an allegation has been made does not necessarily mean that it is automatically true. So without any kind of um, time that I've spent on corroborating that particular allegation, I, I, I don't know. So I, I really hesitate to make some kind of a conclusion off of that. Okay, so number 11 is regarding the dispute about who wrote the op-ed title, regardless of who wrote it, isn't it enough if the average reader thinks that it was written by Amber Heard? So this is getting at the whole controversy about whether or not Amber Heard wrote the title of the op-ed that had to do with sexual violence, right? So Amber Heard's team says she didn't she didn't write it. It was the either the Washington Post that that gave that title to it, just kind of assigned that title to it. Um and it was only in the online version. It wasn't in the print version. Um and then on Johnny Depp's side, they're they're saying, well actually there is evidence that she um either authored it or that she at the very least um consented to that title being that title. So basically the issue here um, is whether or not she she wrote that title or she can be considered as some kind of in, uh, an author or, or um, publisher of that particular statement. And the reason for that is, so the reason why to answer this particular question, it doesn't really necessarily matter what an average reader would think. At the end of the day, it really still matters whether or not someone can look at that and say she actually did have some kind of a hand in putting that particular statement out. And the reason is because it's the elements of a defamation claim. It has to be a statement that she has made. So if it's a statement that somebody else made, that's a material element of the case that Johnny's team would not be able to prove. Um, and so as to that particular individual statement, um, that defamation claim would probably fail. 
Now, with that in mind, there is a legitimate argument that Johnny's team has been making and that I think that they probably will be able to show is that she probably um, will be able to have been shown to republish that statement. So even though she didn't necessarily come up with that specific title, she tweeted it out and she wrote in the body of her tweet something about, I wrote this op-ed and this is my story and this is what happened. I don't know the exact um text words in the tweet, or I can't remember anyway, but I've seen it. And based on what I've seen, it does look like there's a legitimate argument there to say that she actually didn't necessarily publish it, but that she republished it, which could be enough for a defamation claim. Okay, number 12. Will Amber Heard's cosmetic surgery slash medical records from her cosmetic surgery come up? Okay, so for this question, my answer is maybe. This could be a potentially very, very relevant line of questions because of the fact that she's talking about the conditions of her face. And there is a possibility that certain procedures, certain injections could cause bruising around her cheeks, around her face. Uh, the shape of her face has also changed a little bit somewhat over the years that looks like she could have had some kind of cheek fillers. That's a possibility. But I also don't know to what extent the parties were able to get certain medical records from each other. So if Johnny Depp's team was never able to obtain a doctor's office from Amber Heard as to where she would have gotten certain plastic surgery, or if they are were not able to get certain medical records from there, that is going to be relevant as to whether or not they're going to be able to introduce that. If they don't have it, they can't introduce it. However, even if they don't have certain medical records, on cross-examination, Camille Vasquez, presuming that it's her, I'm guessing it's her, most likely it's going to be her doing the cross-examination, is probably going to be able to at least ask those certain questions, at the very least to put those questions into the mind of the jury. However, it is most helpful if they are able to corroborate those questions with evidence behind them, some sort of like medical records behind them showing, yeah, around this time you were getting plastic surgery or you were getting certain injections, you were getting certain procedures that um, also altered the way that your face looked and, you know, also has a tendency to create that kind of bruising that you are showing to the world and saying that these are your injuries. That would be incredibly helpful to Johnny's case. So will they actually talk about the cosmetic surgery possibly or cosmetic procedures and medical records? I don't know. I, I, I don't know if they will. However, can they? Yeah, I think they can. Okay, so number 13. Where are the Moscow flight attendant and the woman from the trailer park in Joshua Tree? I honestly, I don't know. In order for someone to testify as to a particular incident, a, a, any kind of a fact witness, they have to be, well, I mean, even not just fact witnesses, expert witnesses too, they have to be served as a, a subpoena in order to appear. Now, that's a prime example of that is we know exactly where Elon Musk is, right? He's all over Twitter these days talking about how he's trying to buy Twitter. However, because he was never properly served a subpoena in this particular case, they can't call him as a witness at this point. So, you know, he's not going to be coming in to testify. I don't know what kind of efforts were made, if any, to... Um, what if any? Anyway, sorry. Uh, but I don't know... What, if any, efforts were made to call the Moscow flight attendant or the, um, the, the, the woman from the Joshua Tree trailer park to this case in order to depose them or to um, bring them in as witnesses to the trial? But my guess is, you know, someone probably tried and were unsuccessful. Um, if they can't find them or if they can't reach them, then obviously they, they can't be subpoenaed. There's also a possibility that these two women don't exist. I think as far as the Joshua Tree trailer park woman, that probably is a little bit less likely since Johnny also testified about that particular incident. So my guess is that's probably real. She's a real woman. That probably is something kind of what happened, depending on how you look at it from one perspective or the other. Um, but I, I don't know if anybody knows where she is. So if, we, if they don't know where she is, she's not coming in. Okay, so number 14 is, can Johnny Depp bring in Amber Heard's criminal record? talking specifically about her DUI records when she was quite a bit younger. So in Virginia, there is a particular rule preventing people from bringing in certain types of prior crimes, wrongs, or otherwise bad acts and using that as evidence in a trial. This is common to pretty much all 50 states as well as the federal rules, but in Virginia, it also is the case. So in Virginia, it actually is generally not admissible to prove the character trait of a person in order to show that the person acted in conformity therewith. So number one, something like a DUI record isn't really relevant in this kind of a case. 
it still doesn't necessarily fit within even that exclusion. But even just on in terms of a relevancy issue here, it wouldn't be something that really kind of fits in this case. So I, I don't see it coming in for that reason, but also for the purposes of the character evidence issue. Now, there are certain exceptions to this rule about not being able to bring in certain prior bad acts. And it basically is, you know, if there is a legitimate probative value of these prior bad acts or these prior cr crimes or wrongs, um, then they are allowed to be brought in um, only if it outweighs its incidental prejudice though and only if it uh, tends to prove any relevant fact pertaining to the offense charged such as where it is relevant to show motive opportunity intent preparation plan knowledge identity absence of a mistake accident or if they're part of a common scheme or plan so this is a very common exception in most states to this overall rule of not bringing in bad character evidence so as an example for how these various exceptions could be used for character evidence, imagine that there is a woman who is on trial for uh, poisoning her husband by putting arsenic in his coffee. Let's say that she didn't even know that it was arsenic that she was putting in his coffee or that she didn't know that arsenic would potentially kill him by putting it in his coffee. So prior bad acts could potentially be used in that kind of a case under limited circumstances. For example, let's say she had a history of poisoning prior husbands or boyfriends or fiancés um, in order to do away with them, whether they ended up dying or not. Having a history of poisoning these men in her past could come in as a the very least an absence of mistake um, or knowledge you know if she's it's it would be brought in basically to rebut her defense saying i didn't know that that would happen or i didn't know what this was if she clearly has a history of doing that to a lot of people it's kind of hard to use that that you know mistake or that i didn't know kind of defense so that brings us to number 15, which is why can Ellen Barkin testify if character evidence isn't allowed? So I am not sure exactly what the justification is for allowing Ellen Barkin, Johnny Depp's ex-girlfriend from like decades ago to testify in this trial. It is anticipated that she will testify to a particular incident when they were in a hotel room together and he threw a bottle in the hotel room. It looks like this is a typical kind of character evidence sort of situation um, where it's a single prior bad act that's being used to basically paint him as having done similar things with Amber Heard. The one thing that I can kind of think of off the top of my head as to how this might be used and the, the justification that Amber Heard's team might use to bring her in is probably having to do with his reputation prior to Amber Heard. Because of the fact that reports got out about this hotel incident way, way, way a long time ago, that could be the kind of thing um, that they argue is um, something that damages his prior reputation ahead of time because Johnny has to show that his reputation has been harmed by Amber Heard's allegations here. So if they are able to show that he already had a bad reputation for this kind of DV-like behavior, um, then that would be why Ellen Barkin would be brought in. Number 16 is, can Tasia Van Rie come in? Now, we had an opportunity through Dr. Hughes to bring in um, Tasia Van Rie when she talked about how Amber had told her that uh, she had never had any other allegations against her for DV. And that came out and that was a pretty big opportunity, I think, for Johnny Depp's team to bring in Tasia Van Rie, at the very least to bring in some questions about Tasia Van Rie, if not to bring her in as a witness herself. Now, it also has been mentioned by a lot of people that Tasia came out after there was an incident where Amber Heard was arrested at an airport for smacking her or something like that. Tasia apparently afterwards said it was all a huge misunderstanding. It was all a huge mistake. So I would anticipate that she wouldn't necessarily be all that helpful to Johnny necessarily. Um, but uh, I mean, it might still be helpful to Johnny to have her testimony come in, possibly, maybe. At the very least, having questions about her um, and about that incident might be helpful. 
Um, but the question is, can she come in? Now, as I mentioned, that door had been opened, in my opinion, by Dr. Hughes. However, for whatever reason, Judge Oscarati determined that um, it wasn't enough for testimony about Tasia Van Rie to be asked. But there is a possibility that she could come in because of Amber Heard's statements about saying, you know, I know you're not supposed to hit people. I know you're not supposed to do X, Y, Z in a particular relationship. And then also mentioning how she had in her mind the story about Kate Moss when she was at the top of the stairs. Um, there is a possibility that an argument could be made by Johnny Depp's team to say that, you know, because she had an understanding that a, a prior, you know, story about the partner could bring in, you know, this awareness of whether or not someone was about to do something to them. I don't know, maybe, possibly. I think other attorneys probably can make better arguments than what I just made. But in in my opinion, it's a little bit less of a strong argument to bring in Tasia Van Rie. And like I said, she, in my opinion, is not necessarily going to be the strongest sort of like rebuttal witness for Johnny's case. And it doesn't exactly prove Johnny's case either to show that Amber Heard is a is an abuser. I mean, it kind of does. It helps his case, but it's much better to get someone in to show that Johnny affirmatively is not an abuser, if that makes any sense. Okay, so this brings us to number 17, which is, does Amber Heard opening the door for Kate Moss to come in also open the door for all of JD's other exes? So the simple answer to that is no. Basically, Amber Heard has mentioned one specific instance involving one specific ex. And so what she has done essentially is to say, I heard a story about Johnny abusing Kate Moss in an incident involving stairs. That puts the, the thought into the mind of the jury saying, oh, Johnny did this previously to another specific individual. He probably is doing the same thing to Amber here. That's the risk, at least, that that kind of a statement runs. And so because she's the one to have put that thought into the mind of the jury, Johnny then can argue, I think has a very good argument um, to say that um, basically he has every right to rebut that argument because Amber is the one that has made that into an issue. He has not made that into an issue. Amber is the one who did. And so, um, so he has a right to rebut that argument that she has made by that kind of implication to say, hey, look, you know, she just said that 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 there was a reputation or that there was a certain story about Kate Moss. We have every right to bring in evidence to show that what she just said on the stand is not true. Number one, to basically impeach what she said. And number two, just to, to restore Johnny Depp's position previously from the allegation that she just made about him. However, that doesn't necessarily extend to all of Johnny Depp's exes. It basically is limited to that specific individual who was named um, by Amber Heard in her testimony. Okay, so now to number 18, which says, have you heard the full uncut Australia tapes? I have not. I, I, I really want to listen to it, but I don't want to listen to it until the end of trial. Um, I, I really, really do am interested in hearing it, but I also kind of want to keep some level of understanding of what the jury is thinking. Um, and I, I know that not all of that will be able to come in. So I really anticipate listening to it in full after the trial ends, or maybe at least after closing arguments, maybe when we're waiting for the jury verdict to come in, we'll probably do some live streams on this channel, listening to the tapes and doing some reactions to it. Um, because I think that that is going to be a very, very interesting one to listen to. I, I know of what a lot of people have been saying about it. And then number 19 is a follow-up to this question, which is why can't they allow in the full audio from Australia? What if third parties give their consent? So in order to understand why we can't allow the full audio from Australia to come into this trial, you first have to understand what it is that we are relying on in order to al allow any kind of audio in this case. So because the parties are from California and because most of these recordings have probably happened in California, we have to look to California law on these kinds of, of secret recordings. And California law says that, oop, go get him, go get him, he's home. Go get him. Okay. Anyway, so in California law, in order to um, admit a particular recording between two people, 
It is a two-party consent state, which means that the, both of the parties involved in the recording have to give their consent in order for this to be properly admitted as evidence. So because of this, it looks like the vast majority of the audio recordings, probably all of the audio recordings, would normally not be allowed to come into this trial because it looks like most, if not all of them, were secretly recorded against the other person. Now, because both parties had interest in allowing certain pieces of audio recording, um, it looks like what they did was they stipulated to allow the audio recordings to come in, but with a particular um, <clears throat> agreement that also protects other people that may have also been recorded in these audio recordings. And basically, the agreement that they landed on was that the audio recordings can come in so long as it's just Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. If there's any other third party that is a voice on that recording, that portion cannot come in at trial because they didn't have their consent and because they they it otherwise would be inadmissible at trial. And then there's been a little bit of a follow-up question on that. Like, what if the different third parties consent into it? I don't know. I'm not exactly sure because a lot of this is based on an agreement between the two parties. So I don't know how those negotiations really came down in this in this particular trial. But my anticipation is that, especially in the Australia tapes where you had Debbie Lloyd, you had uh, Dr. Kipper, you had others that I think are voices on these recordings, it sounds like, you probably are not going to get their consent <laughs> to bring these into trial because of the fact that it looks like there is some other, um, uh, it, it looks like it would probably impeach some of their statements that they made in their video depositions. So my guess is that you probably wouldn't be able to get their consent at any rate. And on top of that, there's also Jerry Judge, who has since um, passed away. So being able to get his consent would be super messy. Maybe you could get it from his estate. You know, sometimes you can get agreements that are made with the um, the administrators or the trustees of a particular trust um, or administrators of an estate. Um, this is how you have a lot of celebrities that have passed away that are still in advertisements, for example. There is a whole like like small industry involving those kinds of advertisements. And usually what they do is they get the agreement from the family or from the estate of that celebrity that has passed away. So it's not outside the realm of possibility to get consent from Jerry Judge's family, possibly, but I don't know what kind of conversations were had around that or what kind of negotiations they had. They probably, because of the, the level of um, angst and just how contentious this whole litigation has been, this probably was the best that they were going to get because it just is the simplest kind of response. Okay, and then we are on to our last question, which is number 20, which is, is it a bad look for Johnny Depp to be looking down and writing and drawing during his testimony? This is a little bit of a Rorschach test, I think, in my opinion, because you can have folks like the New York Post look at that and say, oh, he's disinterested in the testimony. Oh, he doesn't care about the testimony that his ex-wife is giving, talking about all these terrible, terrible things that he did. Or you can look at it from another perspective and say, um, well, he actually is just trying to distract himself because he doesn't want to look too aggressive in staring at her when she's giving that testimony. So in this kind of a case, kind of like Amber Heard during Johnny Depp's testimony, Johnny Depp is also during her testimony in kind of a, in the position that's like between a rock and a hard place, no matter what, he's not going to win with everybody. Somebody is, is bound to be turned off by something that he does. And then someone else is bound to be supportive of what he does. So in my personal opinion, as an attorney, I think that it's just fine that he is writing and drawing as he is listening. We know that he has ADHD. So people on the jury, if they are familiar with with ADHD, if they have it themselves or they know someone close to them that has it, they might understand that that actually is helping him to pay attention um, because sometimes folks with ADHD, they kind of need that extra activity that's kind of like a motor activity sometimes in order to help themselves sort of stay focused in doing something. Um, outside of that, it also is just, like I said, it's, it's a way to not come across as overly aggressive in staring at the witness who is giving testimony, especially a witness who is literally sitting right in front of him and they are like facing one another. Um, so that's, that's basically my thoughts on that. But at the end of the day, it's a little bit of a Rorschach test. But with all of that, 
What do you think? Are there any other questions that you have um, that have not yet been answered in our Asked and Answered series? Let us know in the comments down below. Otherwise, I hope you found this interesting or at least informative. And if you did, I would love it if you would hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is uploaded and so that you can join us on May 16th for day 16 of this trial of the Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard defamation trial right here on this channel. See you in the next video.